This morning, we will focus on censorship on social media and accusations that social media organizations censor and remove material. Authorities allegedly hacked an investigative journalism website in Malawi. We look at threats and dangers faced by investigative journalists in Africa. A very good morning and welcome to Media and Society on SABC News, independent and impartial. My name is Spomela Lezondi. I'm sending in for Naledi Mulao. This is where we look at the intersection between media and audiences. This show is not complete without your say. Connect with us via our social media channels and share your views and concerns about how the media works and what we feed to you. Hashtag SABC Media and Society and call us on 011-714-6841 or 011 -714 Four six eight four two. Recently, South Sudan said it may close social media as the country believes locals are abusing it. After Twitter removed a post by Nigerian President Mohamed Buhari, Nigeria responded by banning Twitter from mid-2021 until February 2022. Last year, Twitter suspended the account of EFF leader Julius Malem for a short period. To talk about whether all of these censorships, um, I'll soon be joined by lawyer Dumi Shole, who's also a social activist, and I'll also have a conversation with uh, Tonya Kuri. But first, let's look at this. About four and a half billion people across the globe are active social media users. This includes the largest social media networks such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and the new kid on the blog, TikTok. Because these are online, which is borderless, regulation is often tough. But Debojo Ditejo, CEO of Ditejo Media, says each country has policies to regulate the platforms. Some of the policies that exist on social media platforms are actually founded on the laws of the society in which um, it is operating. So they will abide by the rules and regulations of the country and there are different nuances in terms of um, how to communicate what is allowed in terms of free speech in different countries and, and so they will abide by that uh, and, and all of those uh, laws and regulations of each country. A recent study published by Washington Examiner shows that there's an increase in social media censorship. This type of censorship is increasing in parts of Africa. If you are censoring an individual, that is more about, you know, disagreeing with somebody's beliefs, even though it's not hate speech, you want to muzzle them and ensure that they cannot express um, their opinions freely and, and valid opinions, you know, freely. But when we're talking about, um, you know, dealing with misinformation, uh, you know, you need to look at the context. Is it about COVID-19 or a very serious topic? Um, and under those circumstances, social media platforms need to be very rigorous in ensuring that uh, the users know that the information is either unverified or it's coming from a, a source that is not uh, credible. And there should be processes that are undertaken you know, to, to deal with the information, either to remove it or to add a, a warning message. Society has mixed feelings regarding the restrictions. I feel like social media censorship is very important because not everyone wants to see everything on social media. Some of us are very triggered easily. So let's say someone is falling off a building and I was not, there was no trigger warning firstly. So that will traumatize me. I feel personally it's problematic because it, um, it denies one the ability of freedom of speech. I mean, it goes against freedom of speech. I mean, why tell us we're allowed to say whatever we want to say, then we're immediately blocked for giving our personal opinion? I feel like it's gone to an extent where like people are posting pictures of their body and they're getting photos taken down and that's not right because like if you are free to show parts of your body and things like that people shouldn't like restrict you i believe social media censorship is wrong a in the sense of why do you want to control it's free will you can't dictate people's free will psychologists feel that the usage of social media including censorship can have a serious impact on us mentally Psychologists say that um, the, the effects of social media can, can mimic, um, you know, the, 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 the usage of, of performance, you know, en enhancement, uh, uh, you know, drugs. So it can, 
uh, uh, you know, increase your dopamine when you're using social media. We have also the issue around, you know, seeking validation and, and, and seeking validation in ways that are unhealthy. You know, uh, t so young people will be, you know, affected negatively to that. And I think we would have to look at age restrictions on social media. All right, to talk about whether all of these are censorship, I'm joined by lawyer and social activist Dumi Sole and social media analyst Tonya Curry. Hello, and thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. All right, um, now maybe let's start with um, the freedom to say whatever it is that you want on social media. Do you think we should have that freedom? I think it's actually important to have um, that type of freedom. But with that freedom comes responsibilities. I think it's very important to qualify that. Um, you'd have seen, especially um, in the July, for example, unrest in South Africa, um, people were expressing various opinions, but I think there were responsibilities occasioned with that. And it is important to at least have those responsibilities and limiting those to the extent that is necessary. All right, and um, uh, to what extent should they be limited? I think as soon as they pose a threat to national security, they pose a threat to life and limb, for example. That's where I think any form of, I would say, censorship in inverted commas could be used. Because you're trying to limit, for example, misinformation. You're trying to limit um, national, um, you know, like, for example, um, SAPC as, as a national key point being targeted or otherwise. So certain things can come with limitations. But again, it is important for people to express their views. Mm -hmm. um, Tonya, um, let me welcome you to the discussion as well. Um, Dumi here mentions issues um, of uh, national security as well and misinformation. Um, and he says maybe um, there should be some limitations. Uh, we saw that with the unrest in July last year. Um, should there be limitations to what people can say on social media? Well, I think with the July unrest in, in the focus, I think if we did have restrictions, we wouldn't have been able to identify who was behind it. I mean, the social media um, wasn't the actual role player in the rise of the insurrection. Social media was the rise of the looting. Um, and that was dictated by certain people on the social media streams. And we've now easily identified who those people are. And, you know, then the rule of law takes place. I'm not a fan of censorship unless the censorship aligns itself with the law. You know, mm. we spoke um earlier about an age restriction. Um, that that would be that would be uh, necessary specifically for people who get triggered. Yeah, um, Tonya, people spoke about issues of misinformation, especially um, with that July unrest um, that took place, where um, sometimes old videos were circulating as current information. Sometimes people were lying about where things were, were happening. And then there were also people who were um, cited to have been using those platforms to um, also call people to violent action as well. So what should be done in those cases, do you think? Well, you see, if the rule of law is applied, then then that's that works perfectly. And a little bit of common sense, you know, using old videos, if we don't know by now that there is misinformation and disinformation across social media networks, when are we going to learn that? You know, and, and from me as a responsible social media user, the first thing I should check is, A, is it the truth? And secondly, is my sharing it going to have a negative or positive impact. And we need to re behave like adults. You know, the July insurrection is such a brilliant case study because what it did is it showed that South Africans certainly woke up within 24 hours and said, not in my name. I'm not going to destroy my own home. I'm not going to destroy my food for tomorrow. However, what it did highlight was that there were stories that we wouldn't see in mainstream media came out in social media about exactly what how this was planned how it was perpetrated and then only later did we get the july riots um, um commission you know the rule of law the rule of law and age restrictions i think are, are key
All right. Remember that you at home can be a part of this conversation as well. It's 011-714-6841 or 011-714-6842. You can also hashtag SABC Media and Society on Twitter to be a part of this conversation. Should social media be regulated? Should there be limitations of what we can say on Twitter? Share your views with us. Um, now, do me. Um, when we look, uh, for example, um, at Twitter specifically as yes. well, they've removed certain posts. Um, I remember even during that, um, what was called an insurrection last year in July, um, there was a removal of, um, uh, or a, a, a rather a block blocking of yeah. an account of Julius Malema, who's yeah. the EFF leader in South Africa. Yeah. Donald Trump has been completely removed from yeah. uh, Twitter. Um, and sometimes you hear about people who say their posts have been removed. Yeah. Should social media organizations behave in that manner? I think there's a responsibility on social media companies to also be realistic, right? Um, encourage uh, freedom of expression, for example. But I just want to go back a bit. I'm not advocating for censorship. I'm saying it comes with responsibilities. I think that's very important. And having said that, it then means that both companies, tech companies, individuals must uh, be responsible when they use social media. So I think um, myself and, and, and Tonya, we are aligned to, to an extent. But insofar as um, social media companies, such as Twitter removing posts. I think there are regulations associated with that, right? So before any post could be removed, I think users ought to be given an opportunity to respond. Instead of you having posted something, someone else reports it, and then your post is gone. So I think there ought to be a need for you to be given an opportunity to respond, sort of a takedown notice. You've reached this. This is now what we expect of you. If you don't do it, then it will be gone. Instead of an outright ban or, or, or a removal of an account or a post. So I think there there needs to be some awareness in, in relation to that. And, and lastly, ensure that you know, we do not really, as tech companies, they would do limit freedom of speech and movement. Because for me, it goes to the heart of holding government companies to account. And therefore, it should be encouraged, but it comes with responsibilities. Mm. Um, Sonia, uh, to me, here speaks about responsibilities. But how much education do you think has been done on the ground, especially with ordinary citizens, on um, safe and responsible usage of social media? Well, I think the, the big guys, Facebook and Instagram being, being meta, they have put in very strict rules. And to be honest, guys, if you haven't worked it out now, like if you look at your Facebook feed, you're only ever going to see like top 10 posts that align with your algorithm. Um, and that's why TikTok is so very popular, because it keeps feeding you till it gets what you like, you know, whereas Facebook chokes it. Um, the same is true for Instagram. When we get to Twitter, it's the Wild West, yeah. right? And I think that's why um, Elon Musk's recent bid to take over Twitter was so despised is because Twitter, it's a cesspit. Let's not be, let's not be, uh, let's not rose colored glasses here. Twitter is a cesspit, but it's also the great truth seeker. Mm -hmm. So Twitter themselves have their own restrictions. Facebook themselves have their own restrictions. In fact, we often refer to Facebook jail and Twitter jail, you know, where you're not allowed to use it for a certain period. And they have moderators that do that. So they, they have the responsibility to make sure that, you know, there's nothing illegal um, being spread out there. And if, I mean, they put uh, uh, disclaimers about this contains COVID-19. Don't share this because you didn't read it. Don't you want to read the article first? You know, so they have tried, but humans behave as humans behave, and Twitter is the worst of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, remember, you can be a part of our conversation, 011 And we do have a caller on the line. I believe it's Karen from Durban. Hello, and thank you very much for joining us. Do we have a caller from Durban on the line? Yes. Good morning. All right. Hello. Um, how are you? What's your view on the, on the topic this morning? I do believe that the media needs to uh, be regulated to some extent. Um, it's just that people need to be more aware and conscious of what they put on the media. Because sometimes it can be very informative and very uh, thought-provoking and it can have a positive impact on your life. But then the negativity, that needs to be an individual's responsibility. If they send out false information, then I think... 
there needs to be some sort of responsibility on their on their end to to be um, accountable for that and the repercussions that have occurred uh, from that uh, false information. All right. Thank you very much, Karen. So Karen here um, is saying that the responsibility should be on the individual. Um, but sometimes, um, as Tonya was saying, that yeah. people will always be people. Is that where then authorities should step in, as we sometimes see in various parts of the African continent, where they say, well, you're abusing social media, so we are blocking social media, or we are regulating it, or for a certain period, you are not allowed to share anything on social media? I think the dynamics, especially from an African perspective, are different. What you often have um, in, a, in, in Africa, for example, with our leaders, is they do not want to be challenged. And it's very unfortunate, right? So the regulation aspect of it comes more so of a harsher measure in terms of what they are implementing. But I think the, the awareness campaign and, and, and teaching is, is, is what's important. We, we will always have people with dissenting views, and we need those. We, we cannot always be saying the same thing as a people. But I think when it comes to Africa and leaders and responsibility, there, there ought to be an engagement. And I think it's changed um, so much and it's been quite um, active in terms of social media where you don't have to wait, uh, follow a complaints mechanism. In South Africa, for example, people are able to engage the president as soon as he tweets. You know, um, the minister um, of, of roads and transport talking about potholes or people are able to express their frustrations. And I'm glad that in South Africa, at least, it's, it's quite um, big and it's been done and we, we are a democracy. We do not have that in other African countries. In fact, there's a crackdown associated with people expressing their views. So um, what um, leaders ought to do or regulators, they also have to say to the people, this is what we're doing to inform and in the event that you breach these type of laws, these are the consequences that will follow and it should not be an outright type of ban exactly. Mm, um, Tonya, where is the line then between censorship and regulation? And, you know, that's such a good question. You know, Jimmy just said about African countries and leadership that is um, very aware and cognizant of negative social media's impact. However, it's not just Africa. All of Russia's social media has been taken down. All of Ukraine's social media has been taken down. And it's at that point that us as an audience should ask, why? Why? Am I not adult enough to see the narrative that comes out of those countries? And if the, if the answer to that question is, yes, you are, there shouldn't be censorship. It doesn't matter where it is, as long as you're within the rule of law. And the, the thing is, with Putin particularly, he brought out a law that said 15-year jail term if you share something on social media that is considered false. Now what was be considered false would the truth be considered false so that's that's when you find insecurity in that country about what the nation actually wants and it's at that point that there should be no censorship whatsoever i mean we see um the effects of the arab spring and how that changed um the continent um, and purely through social media we see these huge stories like Palestine come through where they're not in mainstream media. And if we had censorship, we wouldn't care, we wouldn't help. And, you know, the, even the KZN floods, the constant um, uh, community involvement is driven by social media. So unless it breaks the law, and unless, I mean, if your president is a person that's going to put down a law that is unreasonable, sorry for that. But unless it breaks the law, there should never be censorship, ever. All right, thank you very much uh, there, Tonya. We will take a quick break at 011714-6841 or 6842. We'll continue with the discussion on social media and whether there should be regulation and where the line is between regulation and censorship as we see in many parts of the African continent and other parts of the world as well. Stay with us. It is Media and Society, and this morning we are discussing the line between um, censorship and regulation, especially when it comes to social media, and whether we should be allowed to share anything we want to share on social media. My guest this morning, uh, Dumi Sole, who is a social activist, and Tonya Kuri, who is a social media analyst. Now, um, 
Do me, Tanya, before the break, mentioned yeah. the issue of the Arab Spring. Yes. Um, now, that led to basically the change that you saw on social media, especially in Egypt. Um, Hoshni Mubarak was the first to resign because of protests that were largely organized on social media. Is that not reason enough for governments to panic and say, hold on, um, if this can lead to us uh, resigning yeah. and the rest of the world seeing the chaos and the fact that we actually can't manage our, our country. Yes. Um, should that not be the reason to regulate social media or over-regulate? Over-regulation is the problem, and that's what we're saying should not happen. But what I think it should mean to governments is citizens are holding you accountable. So with the Arab Spring, for example, that was a clear indication of people being fed up and being able to take to the streets. Take Black Lives Matter, for example. It's such a huge movement. We've seen the injustices being perpetrated, for example, against black people in, 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 in America, for example. And it is through social media. And, and I think Tonya also spoke so much about what is also happening in KZN, that it's being carried by social media. Absolutely. People are coming out. People are on the ground and say, this is where we are. This is what we need. And you know, it, it really takes it. So it's more about active citizenry than anything else. Else. And I think with governments, for me, it is saying this is a wake-up call. And if you aren't able to do your part and be responsible as a government, provide services to people, people are going to be driving this change. And it could come as a result of social media. Mm. Um, uh, Tonya, um, uh, during um, the lockdown in Zimbabwe, um, ongoing jokes uh, were about VPNs. And there were many jokes about VPNs and how people were now getting used to VPNs, um, uh, virtual private networks, because um, social media was blocked. But we heard in the last couple of days that uh, the ZEC, the Electoral Commission in Zimbabwe, um, has been educating social media publics about safe usage on social media. What would, you, what would you think about a country like that, for example, a country that's been known to clamp down on social media in the past, and now the Electoral Commission says, actually, let's educate people about what we call safe usage of social media? Well, that depends what we call a safe usage, you know. I, I do think that people can be, oh, they can just do the most diabolical things with their phones, you know. Like, I often look at these posts and I think, my goodness, like, do you know that that's going to be up there for years and you're going to regret that forever, you know? So, yes, there is, there has to be a level of social media education and perhaps that should come in schooling. You know, like specifically for kids, you know, the, there are so many predators out there. So it, there should be some form of education on social media. But but what are you going to teach them? You know, you can't if you're going to teach them that you're not allowed to say something against your, your government. That, that's not really ethical. I mean, we ourselves, you saw with Zuma must fall um, that created a, a big change in South Africa. Um, we saw with the lockdown when the president came out and we were all like, he thought he was Superman, you know, and we were one of, we screamed for a lockdown and here we are 700 and something days later regretting that decision. But, but you know, if the leaders can hear our voice instead of being afraid of it, I think that's very, very important. Um, educating people about social media, Absolutely, there should be. In fact, I sometimes think there should be a license to use these platforms. <laughs> Mm. Um, uh, Dumi, uh, what about issues of, um, she mentioned children, and we've yes. dealt with issues of um, uh, social media and mental health conditions, especially because you never know who you might be chatting to, because yes. um, you might be arguing with somebody and meanwhile you're arguing with a 12-year-old on exactly. social media. Yeah, no, and, and, and it's true, right? Um, the, the impact of social media um, cannot be understated. Um, and it, the, you know, it goes on, especially with the lockdown. We've seen people taking strain. But also the converse is true insofar as while we were on lockdown, people were able to still maintain communication um, with families and friends and know what is happening. But on the issue of children, we, we, we do have the Films and Publications Board, for example. We do have the Act. But we need to also don't um, not outsource everything as parents. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a parent and I know the responsible use of social media with kids. Uh, we need to 
to be in a position to say that my child is only limited to X amount of social media usage. If they do use social media, and you can use it for educational things, you know, from YouTube videos, how they could code, and everything else. But as soon as it starts now getting onto Twitter, where you don't even know who you're talking to, I think parents need to step up. And they also need to be um, educated on that and, and limit the time and the usage because the consequences are dire. And what we often find is children are stalked, even parents are, and ultimately we have missing and kidnapping and ransoms being requested. And uh, you mentioned an important issue where parents must parent. Exactly. And, yeah. You cannot trust that. Um, and also responsibilities, right? So we send our kids to school and we just leave it with the teachers. I think it's, it's so unfair. We need to be able to say, how do we co partner with teachers? How do we co partner with other stakeholders to be in a position where we at least have a sensible approach to things? All right, Dumi Sole, social activist, thank you very much for being a part of our discussion this morning. And thank you very much, Sonia Kuri, as well. Sonia, there is a social media analyst. Let's take a quick break, and after the break, we'll chat about um, some of the threats that are facing journalists across the African continent. Zero one one seven one four six eight four one and zero one one seven one four six eight four two. Join the discussion right here on Media and Society. You can also hashtag SABC Media and Society. Welcome back. Now, recently, Malawian journalist Gregory Gondwe was detained after the news site he runs was allegedly hacked. Gondwe joins us this morning, and we'll hear his story. Also in Africa, the Committee to Protect Journalists says Libyan journalist Ali Al Rifawi has been been behind bars for over a year. CPJ says in Egypt, journalist Ahmed al Bahi was arrested a few days ago. Here in South Africa, we hear about increased hackings of journalists' devices. Let's take a look at this package. According to Global Investigative Journalism Network, investigative reporters are under fire almost everywhere in the world, suffering unprecedented levels of harassment, surveillance, legal persecution and physical abuse. Many say this is happening here in South Africa too. An investigative journalist obviously has fears about keeping documents safe, keeping your sources safe. So there are some hairy situations. Sometimes you get threatened. Sometimes people really don't want you to write what you uncovered. Um, I've been threatened many times with court procedures or with the ombud. No one has ever taken me to court. It's been reported on several occasions that digital tools such as computers, tablets and smartphones belonging to certain journalists do get hacked. So journalists are aware that crime intelligence and the National Security Agency really do want to know what's going on behind the scenes. They want to know, again, and I've hammered on this today, but they really do want to know who our sources are, where the leaks of information are, and then they concentrate on that. And that is why they wish to tap our phones, um, get into our emails, get into our private conversations, try to hack our computers or try to steal it. So my colleague Sam Sol and Marian Tam have been victims of that where we know for a fact that they've either been attempted hacks or um, thefts from their home or break-ins, burglaries from their homes and stolen things. In many parts of Africa, governments have been criticized for not allowing journalists to do their work freely. This touching on the Free Zone 9 bloggers campaign in Ethiopia a few years ago. It was about a group of young people arrested for sharing experiences online. In 2021, neighboring Zimbabwe was ranked at 130 out of 180 countries compared to its ranking at 126 in 2020, according to Reporters Without Borders. Zimbabwean journalists claim cases of arrests, intimidation and even assault at the hands of authorities. Some journalists have been reported to have disappeared in the southern African country. An example would be of investigative journalist Itai Zamara, who has been missing for more than six years now. 
Now joining me to discuss what seems to be increasing limitations, detentions, hackings and arrests of journalists across Africa is Gregory Gondwe, Managing Director for the Platform for Investigative Journalism in Malawi. He was recently arrested after allegations that the website was hacked. We also joined by Sunday Times Investigative Journalist Graham Hoskins. He is here in studio with us. Maybe we'll start with you, Gregory. What happened uh, when you were arrested and what had happened before? Okay, uh, so what has been happening is that the, our platform for investigative journalism has been reporting on a state gap here where um, a certain Malawian born uh, business person, Zunet Sata, um, has been getting some huge uh, contracts with the Malawi Defense Force, the Malawi Police, uh, the immigration. Uh, and, and other um, uh, MDS. So uh, we, we've seen that there's been an involvement in the way he's been conducting business by colluding with some officials within the government system. So uh, the, the, our own anti-corruption bureau uh, collaborated with the UK's National Crimes Agency and started investigating him. And the, um, when the investigation started, the Attorney General here in Malawi, uh, wrote a letter to all the uh, government departments and 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 and, and the ban any business transactions with the said business person. The same way with the anti-corruption bureau. So when this happened, everyone thought I think uh, it was a good direction in the fight against corruption. But behind the scenes, the attorney general wrote to the anti-corruption bureau as well as the Malawi police service to order them or to give them uh, a legal opinion, advising them to pay the same business person who they are suspended transacting with. So when we got the documentation that necessarily the, the exchanges, we published the story on our website. And this did not go down well with the, and, uh, with the attorney general. And he started demanding that we tell him how our sources were. But we said journalism does not allow us to do that, because once a journalist goes out their source, that will be the death of journalism. Mm. So he said he, he said he's going to use other means. So the other means was the, the, the next day was we were visited by the police. In, in fact, it, it was really bad, because the, what happened first was the, the actually hacked my phone and the started eavesdropping, and they discovered that I was, in fact, in contact with my sister. So they first contacted my sister, who stays uh, the other side of Malawi in Lirong with the capital. And when they tracked her down, that's when they started asking questions about me. So my sister told me about it, and when I called the police, they said, no, yes, we, we, we are interrogating your sister, because we think you have information that can help us to lead to a suspect. I said, I'm here in Blanda. Just connect me with the Blanda police and we are going to talk and I'm going to assist them with the information. And the following morning, the same guys that had called me from the wrong, we are the ones that came to our office. And with them, they are now brought a court consent, a, 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 a court um, endorsed uh, state warrant. So they descended on our offices they confiscated our gadgets, uh, the computers, the mobile phones, and they arrested me, and they took me with them to uh, the region. Yeah, um, we seem to have lost audio there with uh, Gregory, but um, um, I think we got a gist of what he was trying to um, to say with us, uh, to us. Um, now, Graham, maybe um, we just heard Gregory describing what happened in Malawi to the point that they threatened his uh, sister, family member, um, confiscated computers, arrested the journalists. Um, we heard other cases, uh, Zone 9 bloggers, for example, in Ethiopia. We heard um, about Zimbabwe. Um, in South Africa, um, how severe does it get? We, uh, Polly van Weg mentioned um, uh, hackings that happened where people are infiltrating devices that belong to journalists. Yes, I mean, that's, that's definitely what happens. I mean, we've, we've seen stories, um, colleagues from, from different publications being being followed, uh, having their cell phones intercepted, their cell phone calls, messages intercepted. Um, you know, we, 
as an investigative journalist, you're scratching where people don't want you to scratch. You're agitating people. You're looking into, be it their private lives, their business lives. Uh, you're exposing corruption. You're exposing um, wrongdoing. And it's, it's coming to light. And investigative journalism here in South Africa is getting stronger. It's, it's um, becoming more prominent. Um, you're seeing a lot more um, people looking to investigative journalists and journalists in, in general to, to bring them the truth. I mean, we, we saw state, the state capture. I mean, the Gupta emails. I mean, all of that came out from the Gupta emails. You know, myself, I had my, my car broken in while working, working on the Gupta emails, laptop stolen. Um, and it leaves you wondering, you know, is it just a general car burglary or is it a something else, is there something more, more sinister to it? I mean, colleagues like uh, Jeff Weeks from, from News24, I mean, he's been reporting extensively on crime intelligence and corruption there. You know, you see him being followed. Um, so the, the threats are, are definitely there and the threats are de against investigative journalists. And you know, not only investigative journalists, but also freelancers who, who are investigating as well. Um, are definite, the threats are definitely growing. And it's mm. very much cause for concern. Mm. Um, what about someone who says, well, the crime rate is high in South Africa. How do you know that this could be linked to in, um, the fact that you were an investigative journalist? Um, you know, in, in terms of, it's the reporting that we do. So we, we look at things like, you know, the crime rate being, being high. You start looking at statistics. You start looking at, at information that comes forward. You start questioning it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's from the questions that you ask. You suddenly start seeing certain things happening you know suddenly people know of a, a cell phone conversation that you've had you you ask yourself okay well it's only it's been a, between a person myself and a source for example um the sources and i've only communicated on certain social me type, uh, media platforms that only we uh, have access to in in terms of the conversation bet between ourselves and we've met when no cell phones have been and then suddenly somebody you're you made aware look people know that you met this person at this point. And you've got to ask yourself, well, how did that happen unless my phone was bugged or, or hacked or somehow somebody intercepted a, a call? Mm. Um, remember that at home you can be a part of our discussion at 011-714-6841, 011-714-6842 as well. Hopefully Gregory's line has improved there. Um, uh, Gregory, you were still telling us about uh, what then happened. You were arrested. Um, what happened when you were in custody? Okay, so uh, what, what happened was I was in custody was that um, they asked me to disclose who my source was, but I declined. I said uh, that would not happen, but they kept on uh, telling me all sorts of stuff, like, you know, uh, we are just here to chat. Uh, once you tell us your source, then we are going to let you go. Uh, of course, we're still going to hold on to your gadget, but the, all we need from you is tell us who your source is. But I said, no, you can lock me up, but I'm not going to divulge who my source is. So they now kept me, okay, now, now uh, the, the next thing that uh, was to happen, they were to drive me for about um, close to 500 kilometers from Blanta to Lilongwe. Uh, where they wanted to continue with the interrogation there. But I said, no, we can't leave before I talk to my lawyer. So because we were, were now waiting for my lawyer, I, I stayed, uh, they, they picked me around 11, 11 a.m. And the, because of the pressure now that started coming when I, I, I was inside there, because there was a lot of pressure on social media, um, some uh, uh, diplomatic missions have also issued statements demanding that I be released. So by by 5 p.m., uh, the police now called me. By, and by that time, my lawyer had come, and now they called me and they said, um, they are, also they, they said, we, we are going to ask you again now in the presence of your lawyer to tell us your thoughts. So I said, now I'm going to exercise my right to silence, and I'm not going to say anything. So in that case, they said, okay, what will happen now is we are going to use your gadget to find out who really was your source. So now you can go. So unconditionally, I was released, but now they were still holding on to my gadget. The next morning, my lawyer called me and said, uh, the police are now 
calling for you so that they give you back your gadget. So when I went back to the police, they said, okay, we've been ordered from above that we give you back uh, your gadget, but while we're going to keep on uh, doing our investigations, you can as well get your gadget. So when I looked at my phones and my laptop, I discovered that they were busy trying to snoop around and try to uh, get some information from me. That's, the, that's why when uh, about eight days later, when our website was hacked, it was easy to connect, but uh, it was the work of some um, state agents. It could be the police. In fact, in fact the media Institute of Southern Africa, Malawi chapter, featured a separate, and they were accusing the police of hacking our, 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 our website. But the police were saying, uh, give us evidence. But uh, basically, the argument was, we don't even need any evidence considering where mm. we've been coming from with this issue. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Graham, uh, Gregory here speaks about um, how his devices were also infiltrated. Um, you've also mentioned an issue of devices here in South Africa. Do we know who could be behind all these um, infiltrations of devices that belong to journalists? Look, it would definitely be... <clears throat> Uh, institutions like crime intelligence, uh, state security agency, and other law enforcement agencies. I mean, it, it's you know they've they've got the systems, they've got the technology to do it. It would also be uh, private investigators that are being being hired as well, who also have the the systems and the means to do it. I mean, we saw with the the killing of um, Shal Kinnear, the the police officer, how his phone had been pinged in that. And I mean, you know, it's 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 easy relatively easy to to do if you have the the technology and the systems behind you and the the crooked crooked people behind you mm. um as an investigative journalist whose uh, vehicle has been broken into with other things done as well do you do you feel safe doing your work um look i'm constantly aware that there, there's a threat threat out there it depends on the story that i'm working on um you know and the threat can come from multiple places it can it could come from big business that we're probing. It could come from law enforcement agencies. I mean, it's, you know, to think that there's not a threat would be incredibly naive by any any journalist, investigative or, or otherwise. I mean, you know, probing people who are stirring up um, people up on social media, you know, it's, it's and you start looking into who they are. I mean, the threat could come from them or their supporters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Gregory, um, you've now been released, obviously, because um, uh, diplomats and uh, uh, diplomatic uh, cause all, uh, in Malawi were calling for your release. Uh, do you now feel safe uh, doing your work? You've been arrested even with your sister threatened. Um, okay. at, at the moment, it's really hard to, to, to say that we're safe doing this way. Because I think uh, it looks like there is... There's, there's some sensitivity that you notice from the authorities when you touch on certain stories, especially with the, uh, the, 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 the set capture that we are talking about. Um, for, so, for so long, you'd find that the established media outlets were not willing to publish these stories. But the, as the, a nonprofit independent, uh, investigative media center, we decided to start publishing these stories. And that's the time that we started antagonizing uh, some people within the government system. And the, what, 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 what is coming out very clear is that there is now self-censorship mm. that is happening because of the fear of the unknown. And, and the, my, my arrest, and the interrogation has even sent a lot of fear within the practitioners. And the now it, it's more like uh, yes. doing investigative journalism is something that is now being viewed as dangerous yes. because of the threats that are all, all over and, and, and around. All right. So, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Gregory. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, it would have been great to have more time to discuss some of those issues around self-censorship. But we can continue the conversation online if you hashtag SABC Media and Society. So the conversation should not have to end just because the TV program has ended. Thank you very much for being a part of our program. My name is Pamela Lezondi, standing in for Naledi Muleo. Bye-bye.